everybody, it's Tyler here at the World Championship, checking in with legendary 148 Robo Wranglers on our final top 25 in a phenomenal season they had all the way through. Two district wins as well, too, as 148 looks to continue their awesome division win last year here as well, too, at the World Championship. Let's talk about 148. A lot of great stuff we'll be covering, some cool modifications they've done to their sword drives as well, too. But, of course, as we follow that note journey through, a great intake system will be breaking down a bit more, too. Really love how they're going on the amp and trap. And, of course, we'll be talking about some different software. A lot of great stuff. Talk about 148. Let's learn more about them here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Jason, let's start talking about your uh, chassis that you have. You've done some modifications to your Swerve and uh, a couple cool things on your chassis as well too. Let's dive into it. Yeah, so essentially we started out the season with an L3.75 Swerve and up until actually week seven of the competition season, we decided that we wanted to change to an L2.5 because we weren't reaching that maximum acceleration. So we're actually using the West Coast product Swerve X modules. But instead of having the triangular shape of essentially having the motor here, here, and here, or essentially having the shape that way, we decided to rotate this module back to back here essentially to get that that extension on the vertical horizontal or vertical plane of our robot. And so we did that because we needed the space for our full width intake, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But another great thing about our chassis is that we have these L-shaped sheet metal brackets essentially that just reinforce the drive to really allow for us to be very strong while hitting people and allowing us to be like taking hits while we're under defense and under heavy defense, especially in this game. Um, another great thing about our chassis is we have these shims right here. These just allow for us to be in size throughout the whole robot. It allows for the bumper shock to essentially just, instead of taking all the weight onto the frame, it hits these 3D printed shims and it just kind of bounces off of that and allows for us to be able to just not take as much uh, damage while we're getting hit. Dude, I love that thought process. Gone to so many robots we talked to this year just have just crazy bent frames all the way through. So for you guys, has it been uh, has it been effective for you? Have you had to make any big changes to your frame or swap it out or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so it's been super effective for us. We actually haven't made any changes to our frame, and that's a great thing for us because the less work you have to do, the better. Um, so this frame actually has gone through the season, and we decided that we liked it so much that we actually reinforced it more because nice. it was so good. We have extra weight to spare, so we decided we might as well do it. Um, and that's just a great thing that comes with our chassis, along with being very skinny and taking up the space for our intake to be able to function properly. Yeah, I believe that if we see more open field games like this one, we're going to see more and more teams get inspired what you guys have done for that, because that is definitely something that will come into play too. For so, sure. Ian, let's talk about your uh, double-sided intake that you have for it. You know, watching your team on the field, uh, you know, watch you kind of all the way through, your team is just able to pick up so well. You got that nice wide intake, as uh, Jace was talking about as well too. So walk me through what that note journey looks like on the bottom of your robot. So yeah, during the start of the season, we noticed that the center five auto notes, you know, were, were able to be taken up by both sides of the alliance. So we realized that there's probably going to be some defense or kind of like some contact between the two robots. So starting from that, we decided to go with an under the bumper intake to mitigate any issues of damage. And following that, we also decided to make it double sided for a unique pass through mech or kind of like pass through concept. I'll get to that later in a second. But kind of to describe how the intake functions, we first have our completely totally fronted um, intake roller that Jace was kind of alluding to earlier that we had to modify the modules for. These are simply just polycarbonate rollers and we also have this cat tongue on the very front to give the extra grip on the very on the very like middle of it. But for the purpose of it being a polycarbonate roller, we needed a lower coefficient of friction. That way the notes could actually strafe along the edges down the sides of our shields for our swerve modules. And that way they're able to maneuver into our two inch rubber rollers that are just like the Vex, the Vex custom made rollers that go down into our indexer mechanism through here. So this way it's able to end up kicking up into the indexer mechanism using this little bar here. Now one unique aspect is that both the sides of the intake are actually running independently. So we run a speed differential that allows for the notes to actually run and get kicked up without the need for this bar, but it's used just to benefit it and end up helping it be more effective. 
Now moving on, like with the intake, kind of how I was saying with the unique kind of pass-through design, we're able to actually, in autonomous, have our center disrupt auto that allows us to manipulate all five of the autos running at a 45 degree angle and having them pass through the entirety of the robot and benefit us by having them start on our line side of the field. That's one of the unique strategies that we decided to come up with this intake and why we decided to go with it. Awesome. Makes sense on that. As we continue that uh, journey, as we go up on there, let's talk to Rhett, talk more about your uh, shooter, how that works as well too, and then uh, also your, uh, your pivoting area, uh, break down how that all works on your robot. Okay, yeah, so when we were first analyzing the game, one thing that was very important to us is a quick and fast-paced, reliable shooter where we can shoot far range, short range, or wherever we want on the field. So to first come up with that, we designed our pivot mechanism, which most teams run a sector gear, but we ran that last year on our intake and realized that there was a lot of backlash on it. So we came up with a simple belt mechanism instead. So this pulley drives onto the belt, and those bearings just kind of keep it in place and the belt is clamped to the top here and then down to the bottom there and that bottom piece is actually a tensioner so if the belt ever gets loose or anything over wear of the competition we can just tighten the uh, belt itself and that'll uh, keep our pivoting mechanism as robust and reliable as possible um, and then next is our shooter uh, we went through many iterations over the prototyping of horizontal rollers, vertical rollers, um, different amounts, different speeds, and we finally settled on eight uh, vertical rollers. These are just the two-inch vex roller or the two-inch rubber vex rollers, um, and this was very important to us because we actually wanted to have spin on the note as well. So we run a differential in the code that causes the left side rollers to spin slower than the right side lowers, so we can get spin uh, vertically and horizontally as well. I gotta ask you on the, uh, the sector gear replacement they have, do you have a, like a, a word or a term for what this is? Because I don't know if I've seen like a belt sector before. I, we don't really have a term from it. We were inspired by 971 a few years ago uh, who did something similar, um, and we just rolled with it. It allows for zero backlash um, within our mechanism. Um, and probably the last part about our shooter is our servo mechanism. So instead of using a sensor, we use a servo to detect when the note is actually inside of our robot. And this servo is just automated to close when the shooter wheels aren't running and to open when they are. That way, uh, we can always open it when the shooter wheels are running so that Jace, our driver, is ready to just shoot the wheels immediately. And Caleb can actually show that automation here real quickly. Aiden, let's uh, pass it over and learn more about uh, what you're doing from your uh, uh, trap mechanism as well too, how you're approaching the amp uh, and overall that elevator structure you have for it. Yes sir, thank you. Um, so when we were first analyzing uh, the game, uh, we found that the uh, trap was going to be an absolutely pivotal part to the season and getting that fourth ranking point and uh, ranking high um, in qualification matches. Um, as we were designing our robot, we kind of found that the geometry of the trap was going to be very difficult and one of the harder challenges that this game was going to bring. Um, to achieve this, we kind of went into two separate mechanisms just to be as simple and robust as possible when designing our um, trap mechanism. So I'll first start with our trap, our, our hang, sorry. Um, we wanted to be as simple as possible with our hang mechanism um, due to the fact that it's a single time mechanism. Um, so um, for, our, for our climb, we just have a single uh, Falcon geared 8 to 50 and then again 14 to 50 to get that torque needed to climb at the end of the match to lift the entire robot. We have a timing shaft that just runs completely across the robot to the other shaft that just um, runs on the sprocket and chain system. I think Caleb will show us now. So really just dead simple with our climb. Um, just due to the fact it's just a one-time mechanism, we, we didn't want to have any problems with the climb. Um, we can now go into our amp and trap mechanism. So with our trap and amp mechanism, we wanted to have a really good packaging with our amp. So we actually have a one and a half stage um, elevator. And so Caleb, if you'll bring it down. So our first stage is just our static stage here, and then we have our second stage, which is just ran on these belts, on this single motor that runs across to the timing belt here. And then um, when this stage is first um, raised, it hits this, it raises this belt as well, which just hits this polycarb, which then rotates this belt 
Which just rotates our half stage. Caleb, you can um, raise the amp. So as you can see, it just drives this motor, getting us that um, 47, 48 inch max height limit to get the most efficient trap possible. Michael, we talked about some simplistic things here about like the servo and that sort of thing as well too, but we got to talk more about some of the software that's gone into this as well too. Um, you know, watching your robot on the field, so smooth. Well, not just autonomous, but I think in teleop, there's a lot that goes into this. Let's talk to me more about it. So of course, uh, starting like from the ground up for like the nose path through the robots, as Ian mentioned earlier, we have our double-sided intake, right? And so we need a differential speed on both sides so that the note has like the right, the right amount of spin to like get it into the robots. So one way we do that is we can dynamically change which side is like the front of the robots or like the front of the intake, I'd say, based on where we're like our direction we're driving in and like the angle that the, the pigeon is reading. And that way we can dynamically set which side should run faster or run slower. That way we can just bind the intake button just to one button instead of having like two separate buttons for both sides. Following like the intake uh, intake path, the ring will just be deposited into like this station right here. So we're actually using, as Red mentioned earlier, the servo and also like the current sensing on the feeder roller itself. And that will basically, if it spikes above a th certain threshold and like stays constant above that, that will like notify us that we have a ring in the robot. Sure. And we can update our same machine to tell the robot that it has a ring. So from there, we have like a few options. I know for autonomous, we use like that specific state to determine whether we have a ring in the robot or not. And using that, we can have what we call dynamic autos. So if we drive up to a node and we don't feel anything there, we can automatically draw, like turn and drive to the next node down. And basically to ensure that we don't like have wasted movements in auto. Well, get as many notes as possible. And as we're looking to, as you know, teams start to evolve their auto strategies, there's a lot of this like counter auto that's starting to happen as well yes. too. So having that's going to really hopefully mitigate what that is. Have you, uh, you know, when you looked at designing autos for championships, um, how has that changed for your team? Are you looking at getting more quickly to the midline versus what maybe you had before? Or how has that changed for 148? I would say we're definitely prioritizing getting to the midline faster. I know we reworked our six note to instead of prioritize the first three in our wing to go to mid first. Sure. And all of our four notes and like Ian mentioned earlier, like our center disrupt auto, those all prioritize getting to the middle first so that we can get those notes as quick as possible. So we're filming this pretty early. You've only played two matches so far. Have you noticed any changes in qualification matches yet? Uh, I would say definitely. I think teams are going to the middle sure. more often. I can't say like definitely though because like, as he said, two matches. Yeah, fair enough. And we'll see how that meta continues to evolve at championships. There's going to be a lot of great strategies. So yeah. 148, thank you so much for taking time to tell us about your machine. What a phenomenal overall complete package you've really built here. And congratulations on all your success this season so far. Look forward to seeing how you do here, of course, in your division. Hopefully another division title as well, too. So good luck the rest of the way, and thanks a lot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.